Today we're going to be talking about uh, testing with test containers, like sounds like a <coughs> there and back again. Testing containers with test container. All right. So um, yeah. So you see this picture. This is another picture from my Facebook. <laughs> so I'm here uh, because um, yeah, my name is Victor. Uh, who actually? Uh, was at this meeting uh, like a year and a half ago when I was here talking about the Jcash in the Jcash standard. Okay, so a couple of people. Nice, nice, it's good. So it mean, meaning that the, the group is growing, new people arriving, that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm here because I like to do uh, presentations. And today is not exception, so I'm going to do uh, not only presentation with slides, but presentation with code because I assume Java developers know Java and this is a Java user group. All right. So uh, not only on Facebook, um, this is uh, my Twitter. Uh, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. If you forget this, you will not forget this because this stuff is going to be uh, on every slide. So uh, you can also live tweet if you find something interesting. Um, uh, I will post the, some of the materials of this, um, uh, my slides and code I will post on my uh, website. So you can uh, just have this URL and after that, um, you know, you will find, or I will just simply tweet it and you will find it. Anyway, now, and I like this, putting this, uh, this picture now because, so I work as a solutions architect with, uh, with Hazelcast. I do a lot of uh, communication with uh, customers, uh, with developers, and uh, what actually describes things what I do, I build highly scalable Hello World applications. So, and uh, kudos to Kenny from uh, SpringSource, um, from uh, Pivotal, Pivotal, so Spring Source. Pivotal. Um, and he has this awesome slide from, uh, uh, from Spring, uh, Spring Gaia. So yeah, and today is not an exception. So we also build, we'll, we'll building highly scalable containerized applications as well. Okay, so um, just a quick, um, quick, quick map. You know, this uh, needs to, you know, see and understand everything. So we're going to talk about uh, production, development, and uh, how we can pave this road from from development to production that we have less um, problems, I would say. Right. All right. So, how many of you guys are actually using Docker, like Docker or any container technology in production? All right. I love this. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so Docker is amazing. is amazing tool that um, changes the way how we think about the infrastructure, changing the way how we think about uh, dependencies in our application. And uh, so I will just do like brief recap of the things that it actually gives us as a Java developers, and that we can can have. So this is how I envision development. Like it's like my like a garage where I can, you know, do some some weird stuff, um, experiment on the things, and you know, uh, assemble, disassemble things, um, and um, basically get myself, uh, get my hands dirty. Now, no, let's start with the concept of like why Docker and for Java and why it should matters and what the heck is is, is Docker anyways, right? So the big promise that uh, this guy, who knows this guy? I see like a couple people, like young people in the room. Uh, do you guys still know who's this guy? All right, so this is guy, his name is James Gosling. James Gosling, is, he's a father of the Java. Right now he's working with Amazon and before that he was building uh, liquid robots that uh, was uh, swimming inside the ocean. But the promise that the James Gosling brought to us was, who knows which promise? Once, exactly. Write once, run everywhere. So we have idea that uh, we have a portable virtual machine that can execute your code whenever you run it. Um, idea was so uh, innovative that just only maybe after like 20 years we can actually can um, can actually achieve. We, we know we still can run this Java even in uh, some, not only in the computers, but also in the servers, but also in uh, smart cards, right? So run, uh, run once, uh, write once, run everywhere. However, 
things are getting more and more and more complex. So it's not just a simple promise that you can write it once and run it everywhere. And the concept is changing because so many platforms, and including the smart fridges, uh, any any fans of Silicon Valley in the room, and who who got this like a smart fridge reference? All right, cool, good. All right. So, but actually, what uh, I think these days Docker is bringing this concept a little bit, modifying this idea, but bring this into package one deployer. This is actual. Um, this is actual promise that that we need to follow like the, today because. Regardless of the platform where you're running, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, anywhere, here we will depend on the platform. Here we depend on nothing. So basically the container technology brings us to this idea where you can uh, actually have your application portable. And uh, you should kind of do a mental photo of this, of this picture because it actually helps developers to go from their um, from their um, the place like a garage where they can have their hands dirty into the place called production. Um, and I'll show you how it can be done. All right, so we know that um, we need to start with. Or something. So the Docker is a, is a technology that allows to run the container, but the container itself needs to run some sort of image. Image is, is a set of commands that can be easily reproduced. So for us, from us, for Java developers, we're actually interested in stuff that related to Java, right? An obvious obvious choice that there should be some base image that we can use to build our containerized application. So in this case, it's an obvious choice, right? However, if you go to the hubdocker.com and try to search Java, it will say that it's deprecated, right? How many of you guys are actually using uh, Java as your base uh, base image? I don't use that. No. Good, because you should use this Java. <laughs> so this is even uh, even though for a year this this Java was kind of you're probably building something like on your own, which I will I touch use, base. I use the Zool. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will also touch it on this one. Yeah, it makes, makes a little sense. So a couple of things. Now, the Open JDK is actually um, providing the, the way how they distribute binaries inside, inside the Docker image. Plus, um, there is a special type of image which is called Alpine. So Alpine is a special type of operation system for container that has a very low uh, overhead and the size, like in, in the, how much the packages they bring. Into the into the into the picture, so the image will be relatively small. So, um, if you care about the size of your image, which you would uh, eventually once you start using more and more containers, the Alpine this is way way to go. Also, there is a uh, <coughs> Oracle repository for uh, for Oracle uh, based Java. Also, there is a custom repository. You can deploy um, a repository in uh, Elastic uh, Container Service or uh, Docker Enterprise, or use some sort of artifactory. So there are also um, uh, vendor-provided uh, uh, images. So that's why like, IBM provides their own Java, Azul provides their own Java. So if you, if you so like, and, and it's just a matter of in, in, in what stack uh, you are in. So if you're in IBM stack, it makes sense to use um, IBM-based image. Or you can build your own. Um, or you can build your own uh, image and use the base image in, uh, in your organization. I work with some customers, they actually, um, they're not using any uh, base images from publicly available repositories, they use their own um, images and they use uh, their own um, Docker Enterprise or Artifactory type of um, system to, um, to, to, to manage these images. All right. Why? Uh, okay, we, we, we know why. How? So the couple of things that you probably can uh, can do with images today, um, you can use, um, for example, we, we know that the JDK binaries is relatively bigger than JRE binaries because JRE is just a runtime. J JDK in, uh, contains some of the utilities that we use for development. So maybe you can use a JDK. Uh, images for building. So you can build your stuff inside a container. So you can spin up the container to run your build. 
uh, container. Um, inside the container, if you want to say, uh, you, you probably can run the build if you, um, or run your test if you're using things like text containers that we're going to talk about is inside another container. But for actual runtime, you should use um, GRE because uh, it would be smaller and you don't need to have this all like overhead of this libraries that JDK brings. Right? Uh, also, how to debug? Obvious uh, answer. Um, you don't. So because you bring in debugging tools into the production image, uh, you increase the size of the production image, you need to uh, de debug in, in development. So if it's development, you can expose uh, standard... Uh, I do have one, thanks. Um, in development, you can use the standard Java debugging tools um, to, do, uh, to do debugging. It's, it basically exposes the debug port and you connect to any um, standard Java debugger to this one. So it's actually not that hard to do this. Alright, so let's talk about the tooling. So first of all, um, not first of all, but um, who you, who's here using Maven? Alright, Gretel? Do we have people who don't um, uh, don't do poor life decision and use Gretel? Gretel people should feel more uh, uh, how it's called, uh, more elite, I would say. Ah, just kidding. So I'm just, uh, every, I'm using everything, but I, I like to, uh, you know, crack the jokes about me, guys. They got mad about this. All right, so um, the Spotify plugin that allows you to build your application, uh, to, um, to, to, to pack your application as, um, as a Docker image, uh, or there's a different and better plugin from um, uh, Fabricate is uh, um, Pass type of system uh, that built in on top of Kubernetes and uh, with OpenShift. So they have a Docker Maven plugin that allows you to uh, use Docker to build your own your application and then package it in Docker image. Uh, Gradle, we don't actually need any plugins because it's a, it's a code, right? So we don't have XML uh, XML here. So we just um, have something like this because we can uh, run this like Docker uh, image build command. That's it. So we don't need plugins. It's much better than Maven, right? Uh, but for those of you who still want to have a, a plugin in place, so there's a, a very cool uh, Docker Docker uh, Gradle plugin. Um, um, also like very opinionated. And uh, so what what this thing is actually does better that this thing is. Is this thing is actually providing portability. So if you're running your build in the systems like Linux, Mac OS, uh, in Windows, the way how the Docker, actual Docker runs on the system, Docker and the, the Docker daemon and Docker uh, client runs and where it is, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, and uh, so this guy knows how to discover um, right platforms. So you don't need to write, you know, if it's Windows, I'm writing this one, so for example, you don't need to do things like this. So this this plugin actually uh, gets your code. All right, uh, for developers again, how cool would be um, run not only one application in just one container, but run multiple containers connected. But because in uh, in uh, real life, what we do, we have multiple systems that we're trying to like a Lego puzzle connect together. We have database, we have distributed cache, we have web server, we have application server, and we need to connect this. And the Docker Compose is actually provides this way. But um, you can ask me like why we cannot do this in one image, right? How we can, why we not uh, put all our dependencies in one image? So an answer is here is actually again in the size of, of the Docker image because Every command that you put in your Docker file will create another layer in this image. And uh, if you need to change some of the dependency that you have from database, and uh, your the database installation happened uh, before your installation of your application, you need to throw away everything and, and basically start over. Once you have multiple uh, containers, uh, multiple images for, sp for specific uh, for specific uh, feature, you can update them separately and the life cycle will be much, much, much easier to manage. 
Now, um, so let's move from the place um, where you feel um, feel the joy and comfort into the place uh, where we need to actually get uh, something done. So we go into production. So um, enough of experiments. How we can and how Docker can uh, help us to move into production much faster. So, because uh, basically you can use the same things that you use in your development, it will be much easier to run this in the actual production environment. However, there are some things that you need to consider when you go into production. So, huge problem, huge problem that I see in general in, in organization is, uh, is um, environment that you can actually reproduce over and over. So, works on my laptop doesn't work anymore. Um, and uh, I guess many of you are familiar with the concept of uh, the bus, bus fa factor. How many of you are familiar with the bus factor? Like a school bus factor or whatever bus factor. Okay, so not many, I see a couple of people. So the bus factor means that how many teammates uh, you can lose during the accident when the bus will hit them and your project will continue to sustain. So you probably in the past, right now in this room, people use Docker and they know what they're doing and uh, very smart people, they, they share this information. But in, in past, you might have one guy in your organization who does the build on his laptop, which is might break or something like that. It's, it's a true story. Um, I, in, the 2000, in 2012, I worked uh, as a consultant in one organization when they actually couldn't do production re uh, release if the person who has a laptop and uh, um, a rational, uh, uh, rational application developer, which is like Eclipse plugin from, uh, uh, from the IBM and uh, WebSphere. So this person has everything set up on his, his laptop so they can do a file export as ER from uh, their ID. So this is not what we want to be. We want to have reproducible environment so you can always reproduce this environment in other environments so you can have environment in your QA, in your uh, SIT environment, similar to an environment that you have in production. Um, another another um, Another thing that people are usually facing, especially like since I work in more or less big data type of world, when you have very complex stacks, when you deploy um, uh, Hadoop stack or like Spark cluster, or you have a Kafka for messaging, you have uh, Flink for streaming data, and deploying this stuff will require mad skills for ops and obviously mad skills for developers to, to work in this environment. And having this stuff containerized allows to simplify deployment of this stack. Usually these days vendors provide their um, installation or their um, um, offerings in the form of uh, Docker images. Um, with uh, the orchestration tools, we can achieve uh, high availability of our application, uh, either it's a swarm mode, it's a Kubernetes, or uh, Mesos and other, other systems. <coughs> Monitoring in production is also an important thing, and we need to you know, also take this into consideration. So um, I will just uh, talk a little bit very briefly about some of the monitoring tools that comes out of the box or can be used today uh, from different vendors. So Docker Starts gives you uh, visibility about individual container you run uh, and you can see um, the, the memory consumption and uh, the resource allocations. Uh, Docker itself, Docker Daemon exposes remote API so you can get this information from uh, remote API as well. Uh, you can get the logs from the Docker itself and uh, starting from uh, 113 Docker it has a Prometheus uh, uh, endpoint. Prometheus is the popular tool for uh, like um, collecting like time series type of data so you can uh, have um, constant logging push to this third party system that can be integrated with other systems to do um, to do um, monitoring and visualization of the things. Uh, plus obviously ELK stack and some of the things that are available from some of the vendors. Alright, now uh, it's not like one more thing. It's actually the main thing of today, of today's day. We're going to talk about some of the some of the tests. But before uh, we're going to talk this and uh, see the code, I see you 
you guys are already eager to see some code. Um, let me talk to you about some testing, right? So, um, how many of you guys actually write unit tests? Cool stuff. All right, DDD. All right, less. So, the technically, um, all tests are greens here, right? So, this thing is opening, this, this, this handle is in the place, um, this um, uh, the rails also in the place. However, when we're integrating the things together, things might be, um, well, not exactly the way as we expected. Or like this. Or like this. <laughs> so, um, like as Alec Baldwin uh, says before he was doing the, the Trump parodies, uh, actually, how many of you have seen the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Great, great movie. You just go watch this. It's uh, it's also about. Uh, it's, it's, go watch. It. It's, it's good. Um, all right. So integration testing. So in my opinion, uh, integration testing is actually that um, that um, practices the set of practices that help us to move from from one place where we're happy as a developers in development into the place where our manager happy in production. So having the integration testing in place and how we can do this uh, using, uh, using uh, Docker or uh, Docker-like tools for this one. All right, so this is how integration testing happens. So this is, uh, have you seen this, uh, the, the advertisement from, 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 from Toyota? So they, they have a, so they're not doing integration testing anymore because they're, uh, their cars are so smart. Now, so, as I already mentioned, the, the way how you can validate your design, validate your system that it face, uh, so, so it, it, it's uh, um, aligned with reality, aligned with the things that the people expect in you in production, this is why you need to have integration testing, right? So, pros and cons of integration testing. So, when we have integration testing, we have real environment that either identical to production or very similar. So this why it gets, gets us real-world isolated testing. So we can uh, include the integration testing as a part of our uh, continuous uh, integration, continuous delivery cycle. Um, and when we have properly configured integration testing in place, we can spot some certain problems that we couldn't spot during the um, um, Unit testing, however, before it comes into production. In some cases, for example, uh, in, in um, I'll give you an example from, uh, from my life, from Hazelcast. So we have a pretty high coverage of uh, Hazelcast code base with unit tests. However, Hazelcast itself, we have like a, uh, our uh, the test coverage that doesn't go lower than 85%. Um, but it's unit test. However, Hazelcast is, 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 a, is a system um, that uh, people use, God knows how. We sometimes even like imagine how they come up with this use case, how to use it. We, we never thought it was going to be used in this way. But we couldn't predict everything. So that's why we couldn't uh, cover everything like with unit tests. Integration testing this is an important part that allows us to. Um, to grasp some of the ma major use cases that the people use. So this is why inside the Hazelcast we use um, tools that provide integration and um, the load testing. So we just de develop them ourselves to solve certain uh, real world uh, use cases. So we use this Hazelcast uh, simulator tool that allows us to run scenarios like running like grid of 10 nodes and we have 50% reads, 50% writes, and we can also see how the Hazelcast behaves. So by introduction, this kind of integration testing into our, into our work, um, roughly around maybe two and a half years ago, uh, we, were, we were able to reduce problems for many of our customers. We were able to spot some of the problems for the long-running clusters. So this is why integration testing integrated into development workflow helped to spot the problem uh, much faster. Because 
if it, it's good that we can you know postpone the release saying because because we found something during integration test rather than our customer comes to us saying hey guys not cool not cool it's just broke down our production cluster so um, and uh, since version I guess 3.2 of Hazelcast over this uh, couple like three years almost so we uh, we, we increase the quality of the product drastically now here's some problems right so we need to have something real in the place so uh, what we usually do in uh, uh, when we need to test our application with database we're using the memory uh, database, H2. How many of you guys use H2 for your testing? All right, cool. Um, I will give you some, some interesting thing that I learned uh, recently from one of the colleagues, that um, they're using the tool uh, called uh, Juke. Like it's, uh, it's, it's not like ORM, it's uh, the way how the uh, J-O-O-Q. Uh, how many of you heard about this one? Okay, so it's, it's not like ORM, but it actually simplifies the way how it interacts with database. So the thing is that uh, in production they use Postgres. However, they had to give up on the certain features of this awesome tool and go down on the level of H2 because H2 doesn't support certain features of this uh, Juke framework. So imagine you sacrificing production uh, quality because your development tool doesn't support that, right? Um, and you probably seen this before. You, if you're trying to run this kind of integration test with H2, you're trying to use uh, more like a common concept of SQL that this same SQL can be run in your production database. Um, so this kind of like anecdotic type of uh, scenarios has actually happened in real life. Um, Cross plot platform. Some developers like to be on Linux, some developers like to be on Mac, some developers like to be on Windows. So how we can deal with this like cross platform thing? We need to bring uh, like different versions installed or we have a local version of database that might have some bug in Windows version but doesn't have in, uh, in, uh, in Linux version or vice versa. So cross platform thing is, is, is actually a big deal. And uh, obviously, um, problem of integration testing because you need to bring the, this like, environment. It might be slower than unit testing, so that's why people giving up on this one because they cannot just okay. So we're running this integration test. I'm going to um, um, go for a job, I'm not go go to smoke. So I will go for like 30 minutes job. But since we're talking about containers, uh, there is a solution: Docker. So first of all, it provides abstraction layer on top of the operation system. It gives you a cross, uh, uh, cross-platform um, type of approach. Um, it's CI friendly, so you can um, start um, your uh, containers while running your, your build. Um, and plus, we can write these complex scenarios using Compose for, um, for, 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 you know, we have a multiple systems, you can you know, uh, wire them together in, in one place. So, uh, awesome. No, but, when you start this container, there's no way how you can you know, randomize the port. So when you start, you need to uh, check what kind of ports available, you need to do some manual, and you need to pass this uh, ports information when you start the container. Um, so you can, you need to be actually Google of uh, Docker command line to passing different uh, environments, uh, variables, uh, things like that. Uh, there's no other place like, like localhost. Again, brings us to the problem with worse on my computer. Uh, so what uh, Johnny Ive might say in this place is uh, just uh, remove the database and you know stick, stick to the H2. No, this is not our approach. Our approach is a test container. All right, so now, how much time we spent? All right, 30 minutes introduction, good. Now it's gonna be meat. All right, uh, test container. So it's, first of all, it's open source Apache V2, oh, too fast. So it's Apache V2 licensed uh, framework that, um, that become, that uh, started of necessity of um, a reproducible environment. So it, it, um, it works on top of um, 
Java API for Docker. Um, it manages all these things um, with, uh, with environment, it provides support optimization. We're going to see it in, in, uh, in a couple of minutes how it works. And uh, most importantly, it integrated with uh, tools that you're already using. It's integrated with JUnit, so you can run these uh, things as a part of your unit test. And it's going to be running actual container. It's not going to be running some of the uh, like a, a mocking thing or like in memory thing as as a H2. It's, it's going to be running actual product that you use database, distributed cache, or whatever you use. Um, and uh, another awesome feature that I'm not going to cover today, but if you look into some of the solutions for this, test containers also has a, a pre-built uh, pre uh, images. For, uh, for testing Selenium, if you think that um, your UI testing and functional UI testing should be, uh, should be painful and uh, it should be uh, very difficult, uh, test containers is actually can uh, prove this wrong. So, um, but I'm not going to talk about this today, and today I'm going to talk about some other things. So now I guess it's time for some, uh, some demo, as my slides says. And the best demo that allows me to start with some some tests. All right. So with um, with test containers, uh, the simple way how you can start doing some of the things is um, actual generic container, so-called generic container. So. Um, if you want to use the container of the part of your unit test, you need to start with something like this. Um, and um, what kind of uh, Java container I said to use for you guys? Okay, so open JDK. So we're doing like Java. Um, so, and will I do generic container? So, and what it what it, um, it takes as a constructor parameter is actually gets um, um, in, in identifier of uh, your image and uh, and the version tag. So, if I want to use um, Open JDK, uh, and I'm going to be using Alpine version because it's smaller. Now, this is pretty much it. So if I want to use this container in my test, I need to make sure that this, uh, this stuff will be starting much um, on the earlier than our test. So for this one, I can use either a rule annotation that will uh, instantiate this, this piece of code every time when we run um, any, um, any, um, any test method. Sorry. Um, or... Um, if I do class rule, obviously sometimes you want to have a container that will be um, that will be running throughout all your uh, methods of your test. For example, you're starting some of the functionality that you know that you don't want to wait for uh, for a certain time. Um, so, and this is pretty much it. So, um, if I will run this. Um, and let's explore some of the output uh, of uh, uh, test containers. Woo now, um, obviously, because it's going to be here, we need to make it public and static. <coughs> and um, uh, no image, uh, no, we just do latest. Oops, some of the Russian text. So what happens here is that it will start um, this uh, the the library Java library that will interact with the actual uh, Docker daemon and uh, will if it's if this image is not available in your uh, in your class path um, so you need to um, you need to download this one so probably here is. Yep. Is that a generic container that the import statement is that like a open source project that Yes. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the project called Test Containers. This is the name of the project. There's a whole meeting about this one. So this is just a library that allows you to use containers in your application. 
So um, probably I should have started this because uh, it's also very important. Um, where's my friends who doesn't, don't make poor life uh, decisions? Uh, because I'm using Gradle here. Um, so as you can see here, this is, this is what um, you need to add um, to your uh, build, build file. Uh, Maven guys will figure out what to add. So basically, uh, test containers um, gives you all this functionality. So what it says, um, so that couldn't find, um, couldn't find this image. So screw this, we're gonna do Hazelcast. Hazelcast, and Hazelcast actually, um, as a tool, um, we think that the Docker environment is very uh, suitable for, for the things that we do because we run in memory. We don't have like a, the uh, disk, we don't need to have this. So we, we can run in the containers because it's ephemeral and it will um, can disappear and uh, things like that. So what I will do here, so instead of Java, I'll do Hazelcast. Uh, so with Hazelcast, I can, or if latest, latest, um, so in this case, I will bring this, um, uh, this container. Now, so Hazelcast is the system that is a network system. You need to interact somehow with container. So the, the, in the test containers, uh, got you covered in this point. So to get, uh, first of all, um, you need to expose some of the ports uh, of, of this and in this case, you can do something like this with port. Um, and you can provide a port that you want to expose from, uh, from the container. So my container, the Hazelcast container, has um, 5702, which is default port that we'll, um, uh, we'll listen. So I'll just do 5701. Um, and how I can interact with this container, so since my class rule will be executed before, even before I run before uh, method in my test, um, here when I will uh, execute this test thing, um, I can get, first of all, get container um, IP address. So I will get the address of this one. So in this case, maybe in the local host, it maybe doesn't make sense, but sometimes you want to run it uh, from, uh, you might run the, the, the Docker daemon on the remote server. So in this case, you need to have IP address. And another thing that you need is obviously port. But uh, in this case, this port is not pre-configured. Remember, I think with the no port randomization with the standard uh, Docker uh, Docker thing. So um, the test containers allows us. It, it's actually generate a local a port that will be mapped into the port that the container exposes. And I can do. Um, and I can do. If I expose multiple ports, I can get uh, many ports. But in this case, I just exposed one, um, and. Uh, this is pretty much it. So in many cases, it's just enough for uh, for uh, simple uh, simple systems. For example, if you're doing uh, something with Redis, you just need to IP address and port, and after that you can connect with your Java application. So uh, and Hazelcast provides a little bit more apart from that. Um, so let me uh, actually quickly run so we can explore some of the output of this of this of this container. So. In the output, um, it creates container from predefined image. So I do have this image cached locally, so this is why I don't need to, to download this from from internet. Um, how I can uh, go and find something, I can go here, which is Docker Hub, I can do Hazelcast um, and uh, download it from here. So this is image that posted there. Um, and also you can use any version. Um, with uh, with test containers and the JUnit and uh, parameterized tests with JUnit, you can actually test your application against multiple versions of the container uh, with parameterized test, which is actually nice because you can write one generic test and you can see how your application behaves with different versions. For example, you're developing some of the product that you will ship to your customers and you need to make sure that you are working with all these environments um, that you claim and you work with, for example. Now, okay, so it's not, not, that, not that, that, that exciting because I just start container and I'm not doing anything here. So let's do something, um, something exciting. So, so first of all, Hazelcast itself um, um, 
provides multiple ways how we can interact with web. So um, because it provides the memory storage, so it should have some sort of interface that allows me to put data there and read data from, from, from there, right? So in this case, I'm going to be uh, exploring the things called um, the REST interface. So to enable REST interface, uh, if I will go to documentation and will read some documentation about Hazelcast, I'll find that to enable this REST interface, I need to do um, um, I need to pass Java environment variable. So it's called minus d hazelcast.rest enable true. Now, test uh, containers also got us covered here. So if I will do something like this with environment, uh, um, I can pass thing like Java opts and I can pass something like minus d Guest rest enabled equals true. So how how I, I know how I know that Hazelcast will listen to me to do this uh, because I know that this Java opts uh, will be used uh, by Hazelcast. So this is something that you can also configure in your um, in in your system or in your image that you use to um, you know configure externally. Um, also. Um, I want to make sure that when I start, when I start this uh, this container, I will it will be ready for me to use it. So in this case, I can provide some of the um, to wait uh, conditions. So I can do um, uh, wait for, and it actually accepts some of the strategies. Since I enable REST interface, that um, the test containers actually can pull this particular URL, and when this URL will send to Hunter to me, I would make sure that this, this container is ready. So for uh, for Hazelcast, it means that it will be using so-called HTTP wait strategy uh, with path that I need to provide. So in this case, it's going to be Hazelcast, REST, uh, I guess it's a cluster. Or something like that. Um, I'm still. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna show how to run because I already have pre uh, predefined uh, predefined tests. So this um, will be much easier. So now the container will start and wait until this uh, URL will be available, so you can start doing something with your test. So let me actually show you how it looks like from perspective of um, from perspective of um, actual test. So I have um, this strategy that will listen this cluster, and here in my in my actual test method, let me just uh, hide this one real quick and hide here. So in this test, I start the container that will uh, expose the REST interface that can be accessible through container host port slash hazelcat slash rest slash maps uh, name of the map and the key that I want to put there and um, response will check if it's a 200 meaning that the record was successfully written there um, also um, I want uh, I'm, I'm starting this as a class rule because I want to reuse the results of this um, of this operation in my next uh, next test. Usually, you're not doing this because you want to have an important uh, test method. So you will your test methods will not depend on this one. But sometimes, um, if you want to speed up, you want to start a container before um, before actual. So who's calling it? Docker or daemon? The Docker host daemon is calling you back. Yes. So the way how it looks like, um, just give me um, give me a second. I will. We'll return here. So the way how it looks, you have in your computer or your server, you have so-called Docker uh, daemon. So Docker daemon, this is process that always runs, and this is uh, this daemon is actually operates with the kernel to start and stop the containers. Now the next thing you have a. Um, uh, you have a, some sort of like Docker client, which is like a native. Uh, so if you're writing in your console, you're writing Docker. It's a Docker client. So Docker client uh, interacting with um, with daemon. Um, also, the daemon itself exposes remote API. So basically, it's the REST API. If 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 we go in into the 
um, very low level details, it's actually REST API. So here we actually dealing with um, so, so if we have not Docker REST, Java API. Name, right? huh? like we don't enable it's it's REST. nothing that you don't need to do anything. So when you do uh, so as you can see here. So when this this container uh, in Java API starts, it's actually trying to find uh, the, this running Docker daemon. So the way how it works, at least on my Mac, it uses um, it uses U U uh, Unix, Unix socket to, to connect this. Yeah. But uh, after it discovers it, it can send commands there. But as a developer, you don't usually do this. You're using some high level API. In this case, you're using Java API to interact with this uh, Docker. Uh, um, Docker daemon. Up on top of the Java API, there is a your uh, generic container, which is uh, already wraps and hides some of the complexities. Actually, it's not actually hides because the test containers actually exposes some of the APIs that you can actually build uh, your Docker um, Docker file from Java code. I'm not going to do this today because I want to cover many things, but um, this is kind of um, possible to Actually, do. Actually, Mesos yes. does exactly the same thing similar to this. Mesos I believe so, yeah. That, so. Okay. I don't see why um, everyone will be doing something different. So, only thing that you can do different is, is interacting with daemon either through the native client or some sort of API. Now, and in your actual unit test, or in this case, we're using unit test as a framework for writing our integration tests, um, interacts with this like JUnit. So this is how it looks like from perspective of um, from perspective of how, how the things are tied together. All right. Uh, okay. So I will. Uh, um, yes. All right, now, um, so let me show you what I do have here. So in this case, now, I already, and I'm not talking about these like low level abstractions. I'm on the way how I can test my Hazelcast cluster. I'm writing tests to test this. And in this case, I'm not doing anything um, uh, uh, very complex. So in this case, it's just exposed as the REST interface. If I will run this, hopefully it will not break. Um, so um, it will start. Okay, so in this case, I delegated this call to the, um, of course, because it's going to be comp compiling. Okay, so so this is how we're dealing with compiler problem, right? So we just you know commented out the things. Um, hopefully it will build. Yep. All right. Um, so in this case, um, I'm uh, delegating this call to um, to Gradle to run this test. So in this case, I'm running same environment in my IDE that I will run in my continuous um, continuous integration environment. So the way how it works, like because I assigned this like wait strategy, the default value for wait is the 60 seconds. It's going to be waiting for this URL to be available, so it was available much faster. And after that, I can do my my actual test. So this is my uh, post method. Um, doesn't play. It doesn't print anything because it's just a simple assertion. Um, I use OK HTTP client to interact with REST interface, but you can use uh, whatever uh, whatever HTTP client you want to use um, in in your application. So this is kind of baseline, right? So any questions about the baseline? So you can achieve pretty much the same thing if you would uh, run this with some sort of uh, HTTP server and trying to spin up this HTTP server and uh, do some basic put and get type of uh, type of request because we're going to be going uh, deeper right now. All right, now. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, do, 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 what I will show you to, uh, actually, let's go with, yeah, the health check. So the health check does pretty much the same thing, uh, only difference that I'm just can specify a different version. 
So in general, um, this is something that you not get from the generic container. So let's take a look inside what this uh, Hazelcast container means. So um, this is how I structured my, uh, my, my own container. I, I will just uh, open source this with part of the um, test container so you can reuse these containers if you're using Hazelcast. Hey, do we have anyone who uses Hazelcast here? Or just that uh, almost useful or useless information of today evening? Okay. <laughs> What's the reason why it was before? Not today. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so the way how it uh, actually works, I'm not doing anything special, but rather just passing um, some of the uh, environment variables here. So the way how the container is is structured, so there is a uh, constructor which uh, basically will get the basic information from um, the, from the image name and and uh, and. Um, And the version. So in this case, I delegate this call to a super method, which is uh, my generic container, basically. Now, um, before everything will start working, um, the test container framework will invoke a method called um, configure that allows me to do some of the some of the customization. So in this case, um, I'm following this like a Fluent API, building some of the features of my container. In this particular case, I'm enabling REST, enabling some HTTP um, uh, health check and things like that. And after that. Um, uh, This method configure will be providing fully configured, uh, fully configured uh, container for Hazelcast. Now, uh, with integration testing, we we can also integrate with something else. So in this case. There is very, uh, very interesting use case that many people, um, many or Hazelcast users use. Uh, it's a thing called uh, read through cache, meaning that. In typical pattern that many of you are familiar, you have a cache and your uh, database, they sort of side by side. So you check at your cache, if data isn't in the cache, you go into database, read from database, put in the cache, and after that, you can return a result. It's called cache aside. However, when your cache is smart enough to deal with a database connection, it's called a read through or write through cache. So you can go to the cache and the cache side. okay, I don't have anything in, uh, in, in me, but I know how to retrieve it. So in this case, it goes to database for you and return result also for you so um, you it's it's in, in your application you actually using just um, just this piece and I will try to um, kind of explain and uh, model this use case using test container framework so what I need to to have in in this kind of scenario so first of all I need to have um, my cache I do have it. We've already seen this. Next, I need to have some sort of database. So I'm lazy and I'm young and I hate SQL, so that's why I'm using Mongo. So this is how uh, modern developers are thinking about um, choosing the software for their uh, the next startup, right? So in this case, uh, where's my Mongo map logger? So in this case, I do a thing called The Mongo container that will basically bring the MongoDB with particular version here. Um, I'm going to be using this one now. Um, I need to expose the port for obvious reasons, so the other containers and the clients will will be able to interact with. Um, some of the things that we're gonna it's not uh, not very essential right now so we, it's just the way how um, I will s print the output of the container inside of my console. However, there's a very interesting thing here called with a network. So um, if you ever use the Compose, you know, uh, how many of you actually used the Docker Compose before? All right. I see like the same people uh, uh, bringing hands up. Uh, other people are sleeping or something? 
Now we're good? Okay, so the Compose itself allows you to run a um, uh, multi-container type of application. So the Compose will build like a virtual network. So these, uh, these applications, these containers will be connected uh, to each other. So we'll be on the same network, so we'll, they will see each other. So some of the nice things that the test containers allow you to do, they allow you to model network as a part of your unit test. So in this case, there's a thing called network that will create this virtual network, the same way as it's done in um, in Docker Compose. Now, with this network, I can now link to uh, two containers. In this case, my uh, Hazelcast container will see the Mongo. Why I need to use the Mongo? Because my um, my component piece that is responsible for bringing data from Mongo needs to know URL. And uh, we will take a look on this one in just a moment. So in the way how it works, uh, the, the way how it looks like, um, if you uh, ever write any uh, Mongo code, it's it's very straightforward. So for my cache to retrieve this data, um, I need to implement a class called uh, the Map Store. So Map Store is basically representation or um, uh, representation how you would delegate CRUD operations. Uh, from put and get uh, type of approach that uh, cache usually does to um, operations that you have in your DAO. So in this in this particular case, um, I do have. Um, let me show you. If you can see this, it's a bunch of methods that I have here. Uh, better. Oops. What? Why we see some Russian <laughs> here? What? That's that's crazy. Um, anyway, so the CRUD operations, load, load all, store, store all. Obviously, uh, load and load all operations will read the data from back in store, from this underlying store. Store uh, will write it back and delete will delete it from there. Now, uh, and to do this, I need to have URL to database, name to database, and the collection. Now, tricky part. So, because of um, because of um, this loader needs to run in the context of my cache. So, cache needs to execute this code, right? So, it needs to be in the same technically speaking class path. So, my uh, my my um, Hazelcast code will invoke this code. So, in this case. Um, First of all, I need to tell Hazelcast how to use it, and I use um, uh, Hazelcast XML to do this. So I'm saying I have this map, or I have this cache that will store my supplements. Supplements. So um, I can invoke this store and read this from my underlying store, right? So this is a class that I'm specifying, but we're running a container. So we, uh, we need to modify it somehow, right? So we need to push our jar that contains our code inside this container. And actually, if you think this, it's maybe not very trivial, but with test containers, it is very trivial. So the way how it works, um, I will show you in my test. So first of all, uh, test containers allow me to map um, jar file inside inside a jar file or like any file from my class path into the some of the file that will be available inside the container so in this case so i'm building um my production code and i generate this fat hazelcast why fat hazelcast because this jar contains all dependency i'm using shadow uh shadow plugin that will bring every dependency in one jar um so in this case, my uh, mapping uh, will provide Hazelcast jar as a part of um, of the class path. So uh, the the Hazelcast container will also honor class path environment variable. So in this case, I'm specifying this guy is going to be in this library, and the class path uh, will be that. So in this case, it will start my container with my code. How cool is that? So you already, you're taking the container from internet and you modify it in place 
uh, in code. I think it's it's amazing. Next, because we uh, we um, we installed these two containers um, in uh, in one network, uh, I I I can use alias that defined here. So I define this container as alias, and this alias would be exposed as a host name, uh, and I can use this inside this network between these two containers, I can use this alias. And what this like custom property does, basically it's also passing Java opts inside the container. So once again, I will repeat once again, because it's, it's, very, it's very complex use case, and uh, it's, it's good if you will understand. If not, it's okay. I will publish the code. You can go uh, after and uh, you know track me down, please. Uh, so I looked at Docker in a while, but when you exposed this one, I thought it would be here. How did you know that the 5701 was going to be the one that's going to be exposed here? You missed the, the my my statement 15 minutes ago. So test containers allows you to randomize. So actually, when you do this, um, this guy, see, this method, if you do this method, it will actually give you a, come on, it actually give you a random port that test container generate for you. So this is beauty of uh, having the test containers taking care of the network for you. So you don't need to hard code or remember this because there's API. Since container is formed and the test container knows it, it stores internally, and you can get this information by calling. Um, sorry, by what? Uh, by by calling this get map port. So this is why you know how to connect. And which is actually a good question because here. In, in this section, when we're preparing our network that connects to containers, it really doesn't matter, right? Because inside the container, they will be running one, Hazelcast container will expose 5701, but it will be inside this network. It's more important how I can get this from outside world, because my test, which will be running here, this test is not running inside the container. This test runs outside, so in this case, my client, actual, like a Java client that will, not the REST client. Hazelcast has a Java client, which is binary client using TCP to connect to this cluster. So this is why I am creating the class, uh, client that will execute all these tests. Um, in this case, one of the te first tests will load data um, and, uh, and will store this data inside the Mongo, because in this case, it will use write through cache. As you can see here, I do supplements, which is Hazelcast map, and to set, in this case, Hazelcast will delegate this call to um, to this method. And this is gonna happen transparently for, for you because you're just dealing with the Hazelcast API. Now, after that, in the next though, I will evict everything, I meaning that I will remove everything from the cache. And I want to make sure that data that I was placed inside my database, inside my container on my previous, uh, in my previous call will be available. So in this case, I will retrieving this by calling load all. It will actually will uh, delegate this call to load all, um, uh, delegate this call to load all uh, methods, and it will bring all data from database. So. I don't know if your mind is not blown yet. I don't know how to, you know, surprise you more because it's it's a really complex use case, and I can achieve this in less than hundred of, um, including like uh, import statements and things like that, in the hundred of lines of the code. I have my database. I have my some custom code. I have a container. I pass my uh, custom code inside the container and make it the part of the container. I establish a connection between these uh, containers, and after that, I can execute actual um, actual code. Um, so if I would run this, oh, I'm sorry. So you're showing us how to do integrated testing with JVM. Yes. Yes. This is what we're doing here. Yes, uh, but not only with JUnit. So test containers actually supports uh, TestNG, it supports Spock if you're using Groovy. Um, so uh, the idea with uh, test containers when they will reach release uh, 2.0 to have more uh, testing frameworks to, to support this. 
So it's so basically your um, uh, your integration test is just des describing scenario, and the testing framework is just the way how you're expressing the scenario, right? So apparently JUnit is kind of um, like. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the assumption here that Java developers know Java, and I do assumption that Java developers know, know JUnit as well. So that's why JUnit was chosen as a common language that people know, because I see just a forest of hands when the people say they're writing unit tests, right? So that's why JUnit here is our kind of common language of, of, uh, of discussing these kind of things, right? All right, so let's, yeah, question? All right. So let's uh, let's uh, let's see what what happens here. Um, so first of all, um, I see uh, it starts my Mongo container, and I see all this output from Mongo container. This is development version. Don't use in production. Nice. So this kind of things that um, you can get. Uh, and you can easily switch to this one. You can go to the Mongo site and figure out which one is recommended to production and just to change one version. You don't need to download something or something like that, right? Everything is already there for you and the framework already will do uh, things for you. Now, so this is um, this is output from my Hazelcast. And as I, you see, I pass these uh, Java options through the minus D property. Why I need to put it here? Because I don't want to hard code this in my Hazelcast XML. In my Hazelcast XML, I also use a placeholder. So in this case, there is no hard coding. There is no, um, it's actually very portable. And you can use same, um, um, same XML configuration in the production. You just need to pass uh, different environment variable. How many of you heard about the 12 factor app? Cool. It would be. That was the last month's talk. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, this, uh, yes. <laughs> this is this is awesome because uh, one of the things that uh, cloud native application cloud native applications um, is saying that you don't your application configuration should not depend on some hard-coded values. You need to uh, be able to retrieve it from any environment. Either it's an environment variable or it's some configuration server. You can pass this information around. So in this case, it's just a placeholder. Now, uh, looking next. So um, another interesting thing. Now, so I also have this uh, in, my in my development. So my, my component has my class and my XML configuration file. I'm also passing XML configuration file also as a part of the uh, class path mapping that I have in my, uh, in my environment. So it starts the cluster and, uh, cluster and it knows how to interact with, uh, with Mongo. So I will show you some of the methods that I invoke. So once I, I connected my client, I can do things like, um, now, I start connecting to, uh, to Mongo from uh, my Hazelcast container, connects to Mongo container and retrieves some data. So, load all keys. Um, where's my... Um, uh, so, reloading, so how I interacting with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with container. I'm just loading this data for particular keys per partition and things like that. I think... Uh, this is quite a uh, quite complex use case that will not require you to, you know, I have a, a computer science degree in bringing all ops team to, you know, to have your database installed, to have your Hazelcast cluster installed, to have your stuff, you know, built and, you know, deployed in the place to run this test, right? I think it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Maybe you disagree. It's awesome, no? Yeah, yeah I think it's awesome. All right. But... Okay, so I will show you some of the things that actually blow your mind. So Hazelcast is a system that allows developers to write distributed systems, right? So Hazelcast already covered um, the different things like dealing with the uh, split brain scenarios when you're losing connection between nodes and how this... Um, how these connections will, uh, how this operation will, will, will continue to work in this kind of scenario. So, in... Um, in the real world, this kind of situation incredibly difficult to test. 
because you need to bring some sort of tools, third party tools that allows you to sort of, um, like when I'm talking about tools, I'm actually meaning like real hardware when you're just cutting your, you know, wires between your servers. So in this case, you can emulate actual split brain. But we're not going to do any like, uh, you know, cutting any wires here because we have a networks inside the Docker. So we can actually do things like this. Um, I'll show you um, the something that I'm exploring right now, which is going to be like pretty awesome. So I have uh, two containers and I have a network between the two containers. And inside my test, I can do things like this. So from the container, I can actually connect and disconnect from the, from the network on demand. So in this case, I can uh, simulate this kind of scenarios where my cluster is falling apart and how my application will behave in this kind of situation. This is something not very, not very easy to do. And I know this because I did this with all sorts of Unix tools that allows me to, um, you know, rewrap because I'm, you know, I'm very bad in actual hardware, but I'm very good in software, so I'm using uh, this kind of stuff. But this thing is actually making things much, much easier. So having this kind of um, uh, framework that allowed me on demand a model situation that um, uh, have a um, split brain between one node or two nodes and uh, in this case, I can configure um, the, uh, the quorum. Hazelcast supports quorum, or it can it, uh, supports the merging policy. When your cluster is is, is uh, merging back, I can I can uh, make a decision what me to do with data. So it's uh, um, if we go in into the world of distributed systems, what you have to choose CA or CP in this case. Like you choose consistency, or you choose uh, availability. So in this kind of scenarios, I can test very easily. Now, uh, in uh, going forward, this functionality right now, it's, it's very, uh, I'm not saying it's rudimentary, but uh, the support of the networks has actually landed a uh, week and a half ago into test containers. Before that, there was uh, some hacks around with have a, having the links container that will create uh, links between containers with networks. You can actually, with this, uh, with, this, with this approach, you can actually have very, very powerful scenarios and you can uh, test different scenarios in a uh, distributed system and how the things will work. Um, is, is, um, yes? Is, uh, these capabilities were already in the Docker they just extended this to call those API calls? Yeah, like I said, on the very beginning, you might be a... Uh in my slides, I have this kind of like dealing with Docker environments. You may be like a guru and write uh, custom um, shell scripts that interact with uh, Docker and pass different commands. However, it's a Java user group and not DevOps user group, right? So we're writing Java code. We're, we're enjoying doing these things instead so, of so writing what, shell scripts. What you're doing here is, is this test containers library yes. is, is basically just exposing all of those Docker APIs. Why are you why are you trying to why are you trying to ruin moment? Why are you saying just? <laughs> It's, I know. It's, all right. Okay. So I, I, my mind is blown. Okay. So I will show you. Um, so let's go to um, um, some of the things that I showed you. It's, it's kind of something that you can you know hack around with your use cases. However, if we go to this organization of the test containers, so obviously we have a Java, which is uh, the basic uh, Java API. You have API for Spark. You have specific modules that allow you to integrate with uh, out-of-the-box uh, containers like MySQL, Postgres, uh, even Oracle XC. So you, you don't need to you know, go in and install it manually. You already have a container that allows you to you know, connect. Is this a uh, container or is this an API for the container? Containers available in Docker Hub. The images available docking hub. Container is something that you run based on the image. Okay, so so this is this, if you use this in Java code, it will pull out that and it will develop. Okay. Yes. So even if you're using things like DynamoDB, there is a, a, a API to test um, interactions. Um, log stack, MariaDB, Virtuoso, Pumba. Okay, so Pumba is cool. So Pumba 
It's so, like chaos monkey. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, okay. so the Pumba is actually pretty cool stuff. So we, uh, uh, with the test containers, we already have some sort of like scenarios when you can play around. But Pumba will take this even further. You can have, um, um, you can have scenarios where we have sporadic like a chaos monkey type of uh, um, uh, network problems. Or you can actually test situation where you need to, um, or you have a, uh, a API calls uh, limits uh, in the different system, like rate limits type of thing. So the Pumba, in the integration with Pumba, will provide the way how it can be done, and uh, it's actually uh, ongoing process. There are a bunch of um, there are a bunch of uh, pull requests right now pending with uh, you know providing this integration for for uh, for test containers that allows you to write the simulation much easier, right? Um, obviously, there's nothing like special except. Uh, kind of buy versus write, right? You don't need to write this yourself because it's already there. Java API for Docker is there. You don't need to write your own wrapper because it's already tested by many, many systems. Um, API that allows you write this kind of simulation integration test, uh, test containers. Um, writing the distributed cache if you have a Hazel cache. <laughs> Who would do that? Um, so what else? Um, and obviously, there's some examples that you can play around with this. So, for example, if you if you need to test some of the UI, I highly recommend to check this like uh, a Selenium container. Selenium container is amazing. It's actually um, you can actually record video of you know automatic tests going through the page and clicking the page, and you can record video only in case of failures. Because you don't really care when the test is, is green, but you can uh, record the video if uh, test test is red. Um, also, you have you can you know using the VNC, you can connect to the running test and see how the mouse goes around like crazy and executing all these scenarios. So, Selenium container, you need to check this out if you're doing some of UI testing. So, so, so let me just take stuff back So. All these containers are available on the Docker Hub, but these are plugged in for your, I mean, this is Java, this is Java code, so you can interact with those containers in a much more easier and friendly manner, right? In Docker Hub, you have images, which defined by Docker file. Uh -huh. Obviously, there are API that allows you to build these images on the fly, you can do this as well. Uh, or you can pull up these images not only from Docker Hub, you can pull up it from any registry uh, or artifactory, uh, Elastic Container Services, Oracle uh, Cloud Containers, and things like that. But this is this project that you just showed is a good way, easier way of interacting. And this project aim is to provide you ways to write integration tests using images that are publicly available. Or if it's not available, you can use, you can build your own images. It's, it's, it's very easy. And the very beginning on the slides, I showed you the tools, Maven, Maven plugin, Gradle plugin, that can build image from your application. And that this can be tested with test containers. That's the one you're telling me is the one where, because I'm more interested in that, but. That's Selenium uh, is a special type of uh, container, you know, obviously image uh, that has these capabilities. So yes, so there's a Selenium container that already has this kind of functionality in place. Right, but this API will allow you to make it a lot more easier than Jake. No, I mean, yeah, of course, this, uh, this is what I'm talking about, the Selenium container, this is the API that's available in, um, in test containers. Uh, uh, I have a, I have a couple more slides. I think there's a question for you. Yes. Uh, what's keeping us from using this just to do orchestration and like just production? Awesome question. So um, I will repeat this. So what keeping you from using this um, for orchestration in in production? So right now the test containers is highly dependent on some of the um, uh, JUnit dependencies. Mm -hmm. Going forward in test containers too, there's a plan to decouple this and have this like core API, the container management API is a separate module. So in this case, you can use this for um, for your you know env environment as a code um, and uh, have different plugins for different uh, testing system. Right now, you you can technically use it right now. 
So it's it's not a problem. Though there would be some dependencies, kind of like idiosyncrasy from uh, from uh, dependency of the unit uh, J unit. So yeah, a couple things that I uh, I already kind of uh, uh, touch base a little bit. Support more more testing frameworks. Uh, chaos testing with Pumbas. Uh, Pumba. Uh, it's gonna be uh, my when I heard this, like my mind blown, because. I dealing with weird situation that uh, our customers dealing with and uh, having the way how I can model this and how I can um, uh, have a reproducible use case. Well, you know, you, you, you've been in the situation when you're writing support and they're asking, okay, can you provide us a producer and they're saying, how I can provide you a reproducer? Because it works when I just, you know, unplug this cable and in this case it doesn't work, in this case it worked. How I can reproduce this? How you can reproduce? Now you can have the ability to reproduce this. Plus, um, oh, it's a, a very interesting. How many of you heard about the Arquilian? Java you guys in in room? All right, so Arquilian, it is a um, very cool framework that um, providing the simplification how you test the enterprise application, Java E applications. In one of the projects of um, Arquilian, uh, is called Arquilian Cube. I guess it's the stuff that was kind of inspired because Arquilian was inspired by Man in Black. The, the Arquilian guy who was responsible, he has this. Uh, Orion's belt. If you seen Men in Black, first one Men in Black, fifteen years ago. <laughs> All right, and uh, the Arquilian says the, um, the the aliens. Now Arquilian Cube, it's a uh, it's a project that uh, aim to leverage uh, containers like Docker containers uh, to for testing your Java application. So. Um, and uh, the good thing is that it looks like right now the Arquilian team and the test container team, they actually joined forces to, to bring like something awesome together. Um, and uh, some will you know, merge or integrate with one another because right now um, Arquilian is, has more features for, uh, for testing like a Java application. For, for example, Arquilian has integration with the project called uh, Shrinkwrap that allow you to sort of generate your jar or wolf or war file on the fly, basically. So you don't need to run through the build, you can you know, generate your uh, the war and jar file programmatically and use it for test. Um, and uh, Cube uh, will be integrated with uh, Docker kind of, um, it's the same, same concept, We're using uh, containers to run, to run this test. Um, so your choice, right? Stay in the you know, classic tools, uh, writing your shell scripts, or writing Java and uh, embrace the world of containers and enjoy it and uh, live long and prosper. So I, I will uh, I will take some questions, um, any type of questions. Um, so please. Uh, just want to say first, hats off my mind for the presentation. Um, just a question I'm starting out with test containers. Uh, give me advice for someone. Obviously, you showed a very advanced uh, example, but for someone starting out, what would be some things to look out for when we're building our first? So, um, the simple way how we can start this is just to go to testcontainers.org. They have awesome documentation, um, they have awesome um, samples. They have awesome Slack. Uh, you can join the Slack and ask questions. People extremely friendly there. Even though there's uh, some Russian people, they they also friendly and they're not calling you stupid. You know this joke, like if you go into Russian forum, like the people will try to convince you you don't need this because you're stupid. This is not the, the this is like, the, you can ask any type of questions there and uh, we, we actually like, as, as, a, as a community, we actually, you know, um, open for, for any, um, any questions, contribution, because it actually creates uh, some questions, uh, they, they, they will create some ideas around how the project can be used um, differently. Um, uh, yeah, there, is, there are, oh, okay. So I, I will um, actually, um, I will tweet the link from, for the slides, I will post some of the videos related to this one. I will post this video and I will post um, uh, some videos where um, Sergey and uh, uh, Richard, Richard is a founder. Richard uh, North, he is a, he is a founder of uh, Test Containers. He's, he, he gave the presentation at the uh, Geek Out, which was in Tallinn, Estonia, 
uh, awesome conference. Um, and uh, the, the, the Sergey uh, of he's, he's also co-maintainer, he also did the presentation. It, it will not help you because it's on, in Russian, uh, but the, I will still, the still good presentation explains some of, the, uh, some of the use cases. If you go into Java 1, if you go into Java 1, there will be two talks about test containers there. So, um, yours truly and uh, my friend from Zero Turnaround, he's going to be doing also the test container thing. Um, how we can also start. Um, you need to just sit, sit there and some, start writing some code. So this is how I end up here. So I was looking the way how I can test some of the use cases with Docker, with Hazelcast. So now I, I, I will just contribute my module and this, all these like uh, things that, customizations uh, that I, you know, probably you will gonna need if you're using Hazelcast, if you're not using Hazelcast, so what I can do. Uh, you probably should start using Hazelcast, so. Um, and after that, it's it's very easy. So the API is extremely easy to 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 to, to use. Um, yeah. So just uh, and they have examples like test containers, example Java examples, uh, awesome resource. How GUI friendly is, is this? Very. <laughs> so because uh, uh, you can use it from Spock, uh, there's a module that in you can actually you can actually Google. I will post the link to the presentation how um, you can use it from Spock in the test containers uh, from from Spock. Um, some of the gentlemen, I forgot his name. He's actually like contributed this um, into core project. So right now it's another test containers organization GitHub. I actually started uh, the prototyping my uh, the, the Hazelcast test container uh, uh, with, with Groovy, but I had to convert this into Java. It was painful, uh, <laughs> but uh, b because if someone's gonna be using this, I don't want them to have like extra overhead of Groovy runtime just for you know because I was too lazy to write Java code. I still can write some code, hopefully. Can you still have the Groovy example? Ah. So the Groovy example is nothing, um, nothing groovier there. Just you know, rename your Java code to Groovy and uh, remove uh, semicolons and parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do, this is what we do in Groovy, basically. Nah, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually um, interested in uh, exploring maybe some like they they sell type of things actually like Sergey he's a very you know groovy uh, groovy guy he's actually contributed some of the things into the groovy core itself like uh, if you ever use uh, ST in specifically groovy macro uh, type of uh, thing so this is something that Sergey he's a co-maintainer of these containers he's uh, he brought this into groovy as well so it is you know, the, the 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 people know groovy and uh, you know they <laughs> have groovy in mind. All right, so thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Um, once again, if you have some questions or you will go home and you will have some questions, um, shoot me a tweet and uh, I will, I'll try to help you out. At least we'll um, send you a link to something. Thank you. Thank you.